Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. And thank you very much, Commissioner Roberts. Uh, thank you uh, for everything that you and the Salvation Army do. I'm so thrilled that um, we've brought so many people here uh, from the Dallas-Fort Worth area to hear about the Salvation Army, to uh, learn more about the really terrific work you do all over the world, here in our own home of Dallas and Fort Worth, but all over the world as well. I'm proud to be a member of the Salvation Army's National Advisory Board, and our board is meeting here today, so you may be seated at a table with one of the National Advisory Board members. And you heard already from our chairman, Charlotte Anderson. Charlotte, you are so terrific, and thank you very much for your leadership. You can tell what a terrific leader she is. <clears throat> George and I are very happy to be uh, back in Dallas. We're enjoying our retirement. And we're especially happy to be so close to the homes of two of our city's most important civic institutions, the Texas Rangers and the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> While the Cowboys Stadium and Jerry weren't our neighbors in Arlington when we owned the Rangers, it's good to have them in the neighborhood now. And I think Jerry probably hopes that some of our winning, Texas Rangers winning, will rub off on the Cowboys this year. It was actually great to get to say that because we don't often get to say that about the Rangers. Um, uh, Charlotte mentioned it, but you all may not really know what it means to Dallas and Fort Worth and to really the whole world, but for the past 14 years, the Jones family has dedicated the Cowboys Thanksgiving Day halftime uh, to the Salvation Army. It's their halftime show. It's uh, the kickoff of the Salvation Army's Red Kettle Drive. People from around the world actually watch that game on Thanksgiving afternoon. And it's, may, it's just me meant so much to the Salvation Army. In fact, I think they uh, the Salvation Army thinks that it's over the years, those 14 years, raised about a billion dollars for the Salvation Army. So I'm so proud that that is here in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, that that's the Dallas Cowboys game uh, that all of us love, our team. Uh, that's meaning so much to the people of the world with uh, this great fundraising from that halftime show. The Jones family is beloved in Dallas for what they do for football and especially for their three Super Bowl championships. But anyway, anyone who's lived in Dallas for any amount of time knows just how important they are to our community as outstanding citizens as well. Jerry and Jean and Charlotte Thank you very much for all you do for our community and especially everything you do to benefit the Salvation Army. I'm pleased to introduce my friend, Dallas Cowboys owner, and the man who built the biggest thing on the Western horizon since Fort Worth, <laughs> Jerry Jones. Thank you so much, Jerry. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, how about from the First Lady, that wake-up call this morning, guys. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm ready to run through something out there to use a little football <laughs> vernacular. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, to uh, Laura how proud uh, we are of not only you, but uh, George, and particularly your support of the Salvation Army and uh, also many things that help make Dallas. It is really a point of pride to know that when someone touches down here in Dallas or drives into Dallas that uh, our First Lady and President are here in residence. means a lot to us uh, and inspires us. Uh, Charlotte, uh, you're right. You told the story. There's a little bit. But having said that this morning, there was a great 
broadcaster. We lost him here within the last few years, but Paul Harvey. And many of you remember Paul Harvey, but he was famed for his now for the rest of the story. I do want to open up here with you for the rest of the story. Uh, Charlotte mentioned that we were challenged. Uh, we were challenged from within. We were looking at ourselves. Uh, it reminds me of when I was a young father and I felt like I really needed to be at football practices or be at something for my three children. And I worked uh, several hours away. I lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, but worked in Oklahoma City. And I would literally sometimes leave about three, say, men, uh, we can meet later tonight, but I've got a row, fly over to Little Rock, be there for a practice, wouldn't go home, and fly back to the meetings. But I felt like I needed to do that for them. Well, a funny thing happened on the way. Later, what I found out was it wasn't them that got the benefit. It was their dad. And having said that, wouldn't have given anything for having done that, taken the time. There's no gain that would have surpassed the gain that I had and personally uh, with that investment of time. There's an analogy there with the way we feel about the Salvation Army. I know the makeup of our group this morning, and I too am honored to be here with you and get a chance to say a few words to you. It does give us, Gene and I, an opportunity. We're sure proud of Charlotte. Charlotte, I can't tell you how proud your mother and daddy were when they called and said you were going to be the first woman advisory chairman in over a hundred years for the Salvation Army. That's getting it done. I used to always say, baby, you can be the president. I know you can be the president. <laughs> but um, the, the investment that when we were thinking about ourselves, the Dallas Cowboys, when we were thinking about, well, we want all good things to be being said about the Dallas Cowboys, but we would look at the New York Times or we would look at the Los Angeles papers and there it would be. One of our players maybe not walking the line like he should. And so it's right. We were doing something for the Dallas Cowboys. For any of you here today that haven't really been involved with the Salvation Army, I want to take just one minute to talk about what it can mean for you, what it can mean for your company. I have a, we, never a week goes by, but what I don't get a call from a key executive of other companies that ask about the Salvation Army. And they said, how, do, how does that work regarding uh, your fans, uh, as we would refer to our customers, or we would refer to our constituency? Uh, how do you handle the fact that it's a faith-based organization? But we, we've got we've to be pretty, pretty down the middle here with what we're doing with our business. Well, I simply say to them, there's faith-based, yes, involved, and we certainly, certainly are proud to be a part of that from the standpoint of our family. But when you start talking about who it is on the spot that uh, doesn't run from someone like Paul in his situation doesn't run from the fact that you've uh, got a mom and two children with no shoes and no clothes. And we're going to hear later from night from a couple of football players that didn't have a place to go with their families in different parts of the country. And they were raised in the Salvation Army program in sports and former Cowboy football players. But when that when you see that in our society, and it manifests itself thousands of times, it's like me coming up on a car wreck, and somebody's badly hurt, and I really am not good and wouldn't be good at that, but a doctor would immediately know to go over and apply the tourniquet and apply the pressure and do the kinds of things. He can handle that. Well, in our society, the Salvation Army can handle those types of human, human situations. And they handle it, and they handle it well. 
I get the opportunity one time a year to uh, sit with the commander, and uh, we do it one morning, and we literally go to several million people on morning shows across the country, and we have it set up out at the stadium, and uh, uh, now we don't have to sit in the rain anymore, commander. But we sit there and we go to these morning shows all over the country. And I get to look right in that camera and I get to say, if you want it to go the farthest, put the quarter or the dollar in the red kettle. Because these people know what to do with it. These people usually, the, the, the officers of the Salvation Army, are many times second and third generations that are sitting there and have lived a life with osmosis around the breakfast table and listen to how to handle these kinds of situations. So they don't flare when the time comes. As a matter of fact, as our commander and commissioner said, they feed on it. When they see that need, they go for it. That's what they're there for. Now, when you have the opportunity to cut through all of that and you really want to put your resources, your dollar, and if you will, your fan base, which is your customer, if you want to put that on the line with an organization, as Charlotte said, you want that to kind of have some safety about it. You want it to at least have a track record of being well managed. Well, I won't go into the 130-year track record that we're talking about here. I won't go into the generations of training people and training, really, if you will, men and women to basically do what it is we're sitting here representing we will do. The other thing I want to say is that uh, I've often said that football is misplaced. Sports is misplaced. Uh, there's too much, uh, uh, too much emphasis on it. Now there's a place for it, it's a respite. It's a place for the real heroes to go, the real heroes to go. When they need a little break, the heroes that educate people, that if you will, that they've healed people, they teach people. They create jobs. Now, those are your heroes, not the ones that are in the ticker tape parades for winning, for winning the championship. The real heroes are there, but to me, sports is a respite for that. But I still think it's misplaced. But I don't have the time, not in my lifetime, to basically work on getting that back in its proper perspective. I don't. So what I decided a long time ago was that if you can't really alter that, then how can you take that? How can you take that visibility? How can you take that interest? How can you take the bannering that goes on as our commissioner was bannering about Detroit today? How can you take that kind of interest and uh, uh, passion that can go with it and pride that can go with it? How can you take that and use it as a tool to basically help people that can't run with the ball themselves. How do you do that? Well, in our particular case, we also have something very unique, and that's the most visibility in this country. Visibility is not the people in the stadium, and we're proud of our capacity out at the stadium. That's peanuts. The real visibility are the millions that are watching these ball games. The real visibility is Al Michaels sitting there saying something. The real visibility is, used to be John Madden sitting there saying something. That's going to millions, millions of people. If you can take that kind of visibility, which we attempt to do on Thanksgiving Day. Last Thanksgiving, we went to over 111 million people. 111 million people, and we were able to really put it on the line in our own way for the Salvation Army. And we were able to recognize an organization that that's not what they have been about for 130 years. They've been about going out and getting the job done. But we can use that visibility and that interest in, in sport, again, to basically create that kind of interest. Back to the rest of the story, Charlotte. Uh, we uh, basically uh, met with Steve Reinemann. Uh, it, was a, it was very persuasive. Uh, many of you know Steve Reinemann. He's such an outstanding leader in his own right. And the next thing I knew, Charlotte had me in front of the uh, head of NBC.
because they were doing the game uh, that year. And his name is Dick Ebersol, and uh, he said, do you have any idea how much 15 minutes on national television on Thanksgiving Day is worth if you had to pay for it? And I said, uh, well, I've got some idea. You guys pay us so much right fee, and I've got a little figure. I can do some math here real quick. Well, he basically said, though, but you know, we've never had anybody ask us for it. He said, the NFL's never asked us for it. Charlotte said, and boy, I just grimaced. She said, well, uh, Mr. Ebersol, uh, 12 minutes not going to get it done. We're going to need 15. <laughs> I go, come on, honey. We got to, we'll, we'll ease into that later. Let's, let's just go about the deal. Well, because it hadn't been, and because of the uniqueness that there's only, now there are three, but there were only two at that time, then you don't have that time filled with all of the shows about all of the rest of the games going on in the NFL. So it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. But the point that I really want to make more than anything, it was perfect for the Salvation Army. I wish I could tell you that I knew standing here today I could see what it meant. I couldn't. I really couldn't. I couldn't see how it might really be a part of and become a part in its own way of Thanksgiving. Now, we're here to tell our story, and this is not uncommon in Salvation Army meetings. People do get up and tell their story. What I would say to you this morning <clears throat> is that, uh, for instance, we're going through uh, draft right now with the Dallas Cowboys. And we're looking at players. And when we look at those players, we look at how they were raised. We look at their background. We have data on their next door neighbors when they were growing up. We have certainly data on what they were in college. We have everything you can imagine about those players as we're evaluating those players. When I think of how I would sit down and evaluate one of the officers of the Salvation Army, how that extends into those 64,000 employees around the country and how that extends into three and a half million volunteers. When I look at that organization that is as structured and as uh, deliberate for the last hundred and something years, how in the world could any of us begin with this lifetime and spend the next two lifetimes ever trying to approach that and create that? We couldn't do it. And so in football, you like to take something that's going good and has already been organized and get on that bandwagon. And get on that bandwagon. And especially if it's something that has a pristine, significant uh, brand. And I'm going to just say it, brand. Uh, I'm into brands. I never thought when I bought the Cowboys I'd be into brands. I wanted to coach football. That's why I got here. That's wink. I'm joking, okay? For, uh, there are some media here. There are some media, okay? Inside joke here in Dallas. They tear me up over this. I want you to know. But the bottom line is the brand. And to have been able to be involved in our own way, unique way, but to be involved in that brand. And to get to, to basically when, I, for instance, when I travel, I'll be out in the country, and I will have, without exaggeration, as many people walk up to me that say, go Cowboys, I'll have as many people walk up and say, thanks, Salvation Army. Boy, we're a Salvation Army uh, disciple, or we're a Salvation Army uh, fan for the Salvation Army. I say that to us all, not only in the room, we've got our national board here, we certainly have this great local board that we have here in Dallas. I not only say that to, to basically make us feel good about what we're doing with something that I might say, but I say that to the other people that are in this room as well. If I could take the dedication, if I could take the discipline, if I could take the passion and what's inside in general about the Salvation Army and put that in the Dallas Cowboys, we'd be in the Super Bowl every year. It's hard to bottle up. It's hard to do it, much less bottle it up with millions of people. Now, that's what the Salvation Army is to me. The other thing is, it's about what happens here. This room is full of the finest people, I guess, that I've ever met, 
uh, as, a, as a group, the directors uh, of the Salvation Army here in Dallas, and certainly we've got some Fort Worth members, members here as well. But when I look at the kind of dedication and where they've got their focus and their interest, we have uh, one friend this week that uh, uh, basically dropped us a note and uh, she saw the damage that was done with some of our storms that we'd had here locally uh, early last week and uh, they, had, uh, they sent a $500,000 check to the Salvation Army to try to help them out over there, 500. So, so that we all, now we understand that's hard to say and hard to count, but it can be $5 as well. This is a credit to be associated with. I can say that standing here with the Dallas Cowboys, and we have sometimes a lot of credit ourselves, but no more credit than when we saddle up and put our shoulder up with the, the Salvation Army. Um, I had the opportunity to visit with our group. I hope not many of you are here. But I told a story, and so I, the reason I hope not many of you are here is because I want to retell the story. I told the story that I was uh, listening to Troy Aikman at an interview uh, after our Super Bowl. And Troy had basically rolled back and without even looking, threw the ball. And there was his tight end. Bam! Super Bowl went in play right there in the end zone. And they said, Troy, how in the world, how did you do that? You didn't even look before you threw the ball. And he said, well, it was Jay. I knew <clears throat> he would be there. I knew he would be there. Now that is something to say. All on the line. Super Bowl, year, for a lifetime, he knew he would be there and let the ball go. Now, ladies and gentlemen, those of us who have grown and are every day learning more and more about this great organization, I'll say this, they're going to be there, and you can throw that ball without looking and know that you could have a touchdown winning play. It's great to be with you this morning, and i um, looking forward to seeing many of you tonight, but it's great to be on this team with you called the Salvation Army. Thank you.